Well, good evening and welcome to the first of the Ian Ramsey Centre Seminars for Science and Religion of Trinity Term 2013, appropriately enough at Trinity College, Oxford. Um, the title of tonight's talk is, Is Atheism Normal? Reflections from the Cognitive Science of Religion. Our speaker this evening is um, Dr. Kelly James Clark, who is Senior Research Fellow at the Kaufman Interfaith Institute at Grand Valley State University in Grand Rapids. Um, Dr. Clark has held visiting appointments at Oxford, the University of St. Andrews, the University of Notre Dame, and has, le has lectured extensively in the United States, Europe, and the Far East. He works in the philosophy of religion, ethics, science and religion, and Chinese philosophy. He's the author, editor, or co-author of more than 20 books and author of over 50 articles. His books include Return to Reason, The Story of Ethics, When Faith is Not Enough, and 101 Key Philosophical Terms and Their Importance for Theology. Ladies and gentlemen, please would you welcome Dr. Kelly Clark. So I'm a little nervous when he says, if there's something that you hear tonight that you don't like, just tell him you can edit it out. Um, it could be a short video. Um, and so he, he said the title is, Is Atheism Normal? And so he's a polite Brit. Really the title is, Are Atheists Normal? And if any of you are atheists, you're going to have to wait. Okay, we, we have to work our way up to that. Um, and I, main, I mainly want to use that as an opportunity to talk about work that's been done in the cognitive science of religion. And uh, there's been interesting work done in the past two years or so on the cognitive science of atheism, and so I want to I wanna try to understand that, but it helps to understand that if we first understood the cognitive science, the basic ideas of the cognitive science of religion, and uh, what some people have claimed about that. And so I, that's where I want to start, uh, although I go back just a little bit, the first uh, person to work in the cognitive science of religion was uh, John Calvin, uh, with his usual cheerful countenance. Um, <laughs> says, there is within the human mind, and indeed by natural instinct, an awareness of divinity. And so Calvin thinks that we're, we've been divinely, or we've been constituted, well, he thinks it's divinely constituted, but that we're cons we're, we've been constituted so that, um, that we naturally form. He doesn't say uh, so much beliefs about God, but that we naturally form um, beliefs about the divine, kind of spiritual beliefs or moral beliefs. Uh, and in Calvin's case, as you can imagine, Calvin thinks that, um, that you have just enough access to true information about spiritual beliefs so that if you should die, God could damn you to hell forever. Um, and that's probably why he looks so uh, severe. We, we philosophers um, have, some of us anyway, have defended Calvin's views. Alvin Plantinga is probably most famous as a philosopher, has defended the views that Calvin holds but un, and argued for it on philosophical grounds. And the views come to be called Reformed Epistemology. And it's got this kind of loose connection to John Calvin. And, and again, the basic idea is that human beings are um, by nature constituted so that um, belief in God is normal or natural and widespread and widely occurring. Now, uh, some of you probably aren't philosophers, and I'm going to give you a, a dirty little secret about philosophers. Most of us believe what we believe for no good reason whatsoever. Uh, we have no empirical evidence for anything that we believe, um, except this, uh, Reformed epistemology. Um, it turns out that scientists have found that kind of God faculty, that, and it's there, right here. These are your synapses. This is your brain on God right here. So they found it. There is empirical evidence that we have a God faculty. Uh, and in fact, whoops, I got a little movie. Now, how many of you are thinking bad triangle? 
<laughs> right? So these are random. Uh, this is a famous ex experiment from the 40s, and some of you will know it. And here are random movements of triangles and circles. And if all of you are fully human, uh, uh, see, it just got exciting. So if all of you are fully human, then you've uh, found yourself instantly ascribing mind, basically, intention to each of those things. In fact, you've probably started telling a little story. And it looks like um, that's the evidence for something like us having something like what Calvin calls the God faculty, some of that evidence is that we seem naturally inclined to see um, mind in things. Even, a, um, even apparently random geometrical objects, we immediately start ascribing uh, agency to them. We think they're agents. They can act. And they act for reasons, and then we ascribe some sort of intentions to those uh, agents. This is how cognitive science gets access to uh, how it is the human mind is naturally constructed. And the, what Calvin called the sensus divinitatis, the sense of the divine, what Planga calls, um, well, following Calvin, the sensus divinitatis, People that work in cognitive science or religion say that we have roughly something like a God faculty, that we have been naturally constituted to form God beliefs. I don't want you to put too much in the God faculty title. I, what I want you to do is just consider um, what, it, what it's short for. Justin Barrett, uh, who was my student, by the way. I taught Justin all he knows. No, I take it back. I taught Justin all I know. Uh, uh, and then... Um, he, he went on in psychology and is one of the major uh, contributors to the cognitive psychology of religion. But Justin Barrett says something like what John Calvin said, belief in gods generally and God particularly arises through the natural, ordinary option, operation of human minds in natural, ordinary environments. So the suggestion here is that uh, human beings, given the natural, ordinary stimulus that human beings are given, are probably likely, um, not inevitably, but probably likely to form um, God beliefs. And in fact, we find throughout cultures, throughout history, that people with roughly the same cognitive equipment in roughly the same environments, facing roughly the same um, uh, opportunities, dangers, promises, they tend to form roughly the same beliefs, and God beliefs seems to be one that is fairly universally recurring. So the question, what is it? Is there something about the mind that inclines people naturally towards religious beliefs? And I, I'm going to quickly go through this part because I think it's probably fairly well known, but I want to get the main idea out. So the claim is, and here's the God faculty, really, the claim is that belief in God arises from the stimulation of universal cognitive faculties. We've already seen both of these in operation in the previous film. The agency detecting device that we have um, a kind of natural impulse to ascribe agency to, to all sorts of things. Um, that things act and that they act for a purpose and they're kind of self-motivating. And then we also think that they act for a reason. We ascribe intention to them. And if you put those two things together, then you'll find that people looking at nature or specific things in nature or um, uh, constellations or trees or mountains or the weather, they tend to think that those things, they have thought historically that those things are agents and that they act for a purpose. And you can see why evolutionarily, I'm not going to talk much about evolution here, why it might be a good thing for us to have something like an agency detecting device. Um, it might be good for us to be able to detect things that are acting because they might be acting detrimentally to us, or they might be acting for our benefit. So it would be good for us to have something like this ability, and then it would be good for us to, to try to ascribe, try to figure out why they're acting the way they're acting so that we can make our plans in accord with their purposes. So the, Justin Barrett hates it when I do this, but the agency detecting device, but plus the theory of mine, uh, inclines us to belief in gods. That's the basic idea of the God faculty. And, um, this is, I think, pretty well known. 
these days and widely accepted. There are other, there are other models in the cognitive science of religion. There are other ways to think about it, but we'll just take this as the basic commonly accepted standard model. So how, based on this, might we explain religion? Uh, and how might, how might we explain it evolutionarily? Well, we would expect evolutionarily, so the, the question's gonna be religions universally occurring. It seems fairly natural for human beings. How is it that human beings whose cognitive, cognitive faculties have been shaped evolutionarily, how is it that they came to have religious beliefs? Well, if, if we're explaining religious belief in terms of evolution, then we have to explain it in terms of adaptive traits. So adaptive traits are those that will help with the so-called four Fs, fighting, feeding, fleeing, and reproducing. Um, everyone knows this joke, but it's just a joke that keeps giving. Uh, it's worth repeating. Um, so those are the four Fs. And Scott H but Scott Atran raises this problem. We would expect beliefs, practices, rituals, whatever human beings do, we would expect them to be explainable in terms of the four Fs. But religion creates a prima facie problem for explaining in terms of these four Fs. It's not something that is obviously adaptive. And the reason it's not obviously adaptive is because religion is so costly. And Atran raises this issue. Religious practice is costly in terms of material sacrifice, at least one's prayer time, emotional expenditure, inciting fears and hopes, and cognitive effort, maintaining both factual and counterintuitive networks of belief. And it's not hard to see and to think of examples of how religion could be costly in evolutionary terms. If you take grains and give them to the gods, you've taken something away from feeding. If you take time away from growing crops or hunting food and pray, you've done something that looks like it's clean contrary to the, um, uh, any adaptive trait. Uh, if you, and then there are more, more esoteric things. If you sacrifice virgins, for example, that seems like it's not something likely to increase our uh, inclusive fitness. There are all sorts of religious practices from the relatively mundane to the more exotic that seem positively inexplicable on evolutionary grounds. And yet we have religious beliefs and they're universal. So the claim is, well, it's not an obvious adaptive trait, but maybe it comes, it's a byproduct of some features of human act activity that is adaptive. So the, the major accepted model is that religious belief is a byproduct, that it itself is not adaptive. And who would think these these practices themselves, I mean, how can you conceive of them as adaptive in evolutionary terms? But maybe there are other features of human beings which, um, if you have those, you're likely to have religious beliefs. So let's look at that a little bit. What does it mean for religion, religion to be uh, non-adaptive? So the, the general claim is that religion is a spandrel. It's not adaptive. And you're all British and you're all at Oxford, so you all know this, but I'm a, a poor, untutored <laughs> colonialist. Um, so the spandrel is the space in between the arches. The arches are absolutely necessary. Um, they hold up um, roofs, I take it. Um, but you don't need the space in between. And you can, you can use some decoration in there. So the spandrels are byproducts. The, in order to have a well-built <laughs> Gothic cathedral, you need a good strong arch. That's necessary, but the byproduct is the spandrel. And we have lots of spandrels. Uh, so um, the wrinkles on the back of our fingers are spandrels. Doing this, being able to grasp things, that, that was probably selected. Uh, having this kind of skin was probably selected, but a byproduct is going to be having wrinkles on the back of our fingers. Our, the color of our blood. Uh, that, that it's red about half the time is a byproduct of it carrying hemoglobin, which was a good thing. That was probably selected. We need it for our survival. But the color of our bl blood probably isn't selected for our survival. So there are a lot of, of traits that we have that are byproducts of other traits that are adaptive. And the claim about religion is that it's not an adaptation and they have no evolutionary functions as such. 
but nonetheless, they're byproducts. They're byproducts, not direct consequences of natural selection. And now that I'm in Harry Potter land, I like this example of a spandrel. Um, so this is what a stairway needs. This is the direct consequence of building a stairway. You have to have that, but you all know from Harry Potter, you can use that space uh, as well. But this is a byproduct. Using that space for someone to live in is a byproduct of this. So that's the general idea of a byproduct, and the claim is that religion itself is not adaptive. It's a byproduct. So I'm going to define a byproduct belief. A byproduct belief is a belief produced by our cognitive faculties that were designed to produce beliefs of a different kind. And so what are our faculties designed to produce? They're designed to produce belief in agency and designed to attribute um, intention to that agency. That's a byproduct belief. And so, and you can see evolutionary, evolutionarily, I've already mentioned this, why it would be a good thing for us to have that. It would be a good thing for us to have that because uh, if you hear a thing go bump in the night or if you hear a, a rustle in the bush, it would be good to quickly attribute agency to that thing. That would be a good thing. And it would also be good to try to figure out what, what's the reason that thing is, you know, bumping in the night or rustling in the bush to figure out what it is. Is it there to eat you? Is it an enemy that wants to steal your, um, your food or take your life? So it would be good for us to have an agency detecting device. We can see how that might evolve. And it would be good for us to ver fairly quickly ascribe purpose to that. And just to let you know that you have it, if you ever are sleeping at night, home alone, and you hear a noise downstairs and you shoot up, you know, your agency detecting device got engaged right away. And you probably quickly tried to think about you know, what, what might be the source of that sound and why. Um, it's been c cultured out of us in some ways, but we know it's there you know, when we're home alone and hear a, a noise in our basement. But the claim is, with, with a byproduct belief, is that uh, it, would, it is a good thing for us to have an agency detecting device in a theory of mind in terms of good in terms of its um, evolutionary, evolutionary adaptiveness. Uh, but it also produces, it's sort of uh, a prodigious belief producer. You know, I, I, um, one time I came home and I got out of the car and it was winter. I live in Michigan. We have a lot of snow in the winter. We get two meters of snow. I got out of the car. It was all icy. And I, I'd been grocery shopping, and I slipped, and, and the food fell out. Uh, and my wife opened the door, looks out, and our dog comes running out. And the dog comes running I'm thinking, do you know the show Lassie, by the way? This makes a lot more sense in America. You know, Lass <laughs> Lassie, Lassie can sense human need empathetically from a long ways away. And I'm thinking, my dog is coming to my need. He sees me fall, he sees me in my need, and he's there for me. And so the dog comes racing out and starts eating the hamburger meat. And uh, <laughs> we're, you know, we're, relent we, we're relentless anthropomorphizers. We attribute purpose to things, fairly human purpose to things, fairly quickly and easily. One of the pioneers in the cognitive science of religion, is, the title of his book is Faces and Clouds. It's easy for us to, to see agency and ascribe purpose to almost anything. So, um, but it's good to have agency detecting device and theory of mind. We can see why that would have been selected um, evolutionarily. And here's these byproducts it produces. You know, dogs that think only of their master's good and gods. Dogs and gods, get it? It was like a, I'm not gonna do, uh, let's see, what's the, dyslexia tonight, but anyway, dogs, gods. Forget it. All right, so, uh, so belief in God is a byproduct belief. It's produced by agency detecting device and theory of mind, which were designed to help us find mates and to detect enemies and predators. The design of them, so to speak, I've designed in quotes, was not to produce true God beliefs, but, uh, uh, but to help us with respect to our inclusive fitness. Um, find mates, detect enemies, and uh, avoid predators. So some have claimed and no doubt you've heard of some of these claims, that what this shows is that the God, the God faculty is unreliable. 
Here's some of the quotes. Oh, the, so there was a cover article in Time Magazine on this topic, and uh, I, don't have the I don't have the cover, but I do have the, the title page. Uh, Does our DNL DNA compel us to believe in a higher power? Believe it or not, some scientists say yes. By some, they mean one. Uh, he's almost certainly wrong. At, at any rate, some scientists do say that. But, but this is the point I want to make. This is, gets to the unreliability. Michael Persinger says, God is an artifact of the brain. It's a human creation. We create artifacts, and there's nothing beyond it. Uh, Richard Dawkins. Is he here, by the way? I heard he lives in Oxford. I was hoping he'd come. <laughs> um, the re irrationality of religion is a byproduct of a built-in irrational irrationality mechanism in the brain. Daniel Dennett, the God faculty is a fiction-generating contraption. And Jesse Baring, this is my favorite quotation. We'll come back to it later. We've got God by the throat. All we need to do is squeeze. So um, some people think that by showing that religious belief is a byproduct, we've thereby shown that it's irrational or unjustified, and I, I take it some people even think we've shown that God is a delusion. So I want to think about if that's the case. Uh, is it the case that what we've learned when we learn that there's some sort of psychological processes that might be involved in the production of belief in God, if what we've learned from that is the, that the belief is irrational? And I want to use this example. Um, and it's the example of a pink elephant. And it goes like this. Suppose Dathan invites his brother Karsten to a birthday party. And on his way to the party, Dathan gives Karsten a pill. Um, and Karsten takes it. And the pill is a pill that will produce the, uh, the vis visual sensation of a pink elephant. Okay, so he's got a, the pink elephant pill. Uh, and it even says that up there. So it produces the sensation of a pink elephant pill. So Dathan and Karsten walk into the room. There's a whole bunch of people in the room. And uh, Karsten's taken the pill. And Karsten said, wow, there's a pink elephant in the room. And then everyone starts laughing. But here's the point. The reason they're laughing is because there is a pink elephant in the room. That's what... Um, Dathan has done. He's put a pink elephant in the room, but the reason Karsten believes there's a pink elephant in the room is because he's taken the pill. Now, I give that example because I think Dawkins, Dennett, and others view belief in God something like taking the pink elephant pill. We, we all have, we've all taken the God pill. We've all drunk the Kool-Aid. You know, we all have God beliefs, but they're not based on the reality of God. God didn't produce that belief. The, the cognitive faculty produced the beliefs. So what I want to do is just think about rational perceptual belief. What, what is it that makes a perceptual belief rational? Uh, how, how is it that our cognitive faculties are involved in, um, I guess, justified or rational beliefs? So it seems to me this part, this much has to happen. We need the right process. So with respect to a perceptual belief, what's the right process? Well, my visual faculties, in, in, my, in the human case, of course, it's eyes. My uh, retinas have to, have to have, light has to come in, say, off the, uh, there has to be light in the room. Light has to re reflect off the elephant. It has to enter my retinas. It's got to stimulate my rods and cones. They got to do something to nerves, jiggle them a little bit, and then they move up into my brain, and that gets jiggled, and then I form a perceptual belief. So I have to have the right process. I may have missed a technical detail or two in that description, but you get the right idea. My visual faculties convey information to those portions of my brain that process visual information, sensations, and then transfer that information to the portion of my brain involved in believing. And perceptual beliefs may involve a visual representation of that reality, but it's a belief, so somehow um, sensations get changed into beliefs. But there's a process by which this happens. It has to be the right process, and in Carson's case, that wasn't how the belief was produced. It wasn't the right process. You don't have a rational perceptual belief if it's produced by a pill. That's not the right process for perceptual beliefs. And it has to be the right cause. 
the object of perception must be the cause of my belief that I see the object. So um, everyone else in the room had a justified belief or rational belief that there was a pink elephant in the room because they had the right processes, they had the visual process, and the elephant caused their belief. And in Carson's case, both things didn't happen. Um, it wasn't the right process, it was the pill, and it wasn't the right cause. The belief wasn't produced by the elephant, the belief wasn't produced by, the belief was, excuse me, produced by the pill. Now, we, it's hard to say what, what the cause is or even what causes are, but, but I just want us to have a rough sense that in order for us to have a reliable perceptual belief, I have to, that, that belief ultimately has to be caused by the object uh, and not by something else. How about, now, so this gets more complicated. How is it that we could have rational belief in other minds? And I put data up here from Star Trek. Do you guys all watch Star Trek here? Again, I have an American reference. So I know some of you watch it and some of you are experts. Data is my favorite example of a non-person. But somebody will always say, yeah, but in episode 272, we found out he was a person. You know, we found out he had feelings, but so forget that. Or if you really are committed to that, put in your favorite robot here for this. What I want is a robot that looks a lot like, like a person. So what, is, what would it take for us to have rational belief in other minds? Um, I think it involves uh, the agency detecting device and the theory of mind. Um, and, and it works pretty automatically in most cases. We don't infer it. And what the agency detecting device and the theory of mind do is that they put us in contact with a person. But here's the key point. We don't perceive persons. Okay, we don't perceive persons. So take Andrew here. I, I see, just like I might see data, I, I don't see the part of data that makes him a person. And Andrew, what makes him a person is not having that body because that's the same thing data has, or similar. Uh, what makes him a person are thoughts, feelings, and desires. That he experiences pain, that he gets sad, that some things make him happy. But I, I don't see, I see happy behavior. I might see pain behavior, but I don't, I don't see the pain. Uh, maybe Bill Clinton can really feel somebody else's pain, but you know, most of us can't. Our agency detecting device and theory of mind is not that powerful. We don't feel another person's pain. We don't see another person's pain. And so we, we don't see the thing that makes them a person. We, we believe it instantly by theory of mind. Uh, but the key point is we don't perceive a person. Now here's the interesting thing to, to see here is how many ways can we come in contact with a person? Well, one way is for him to be in a room and for him to act interested. And then I think, well, he is interested. Uh, in fact, I think he thinks I'm riveting right now. He's thinking, I'm, we're not going to delete that part. I think you're brilliant. Let's see if that stays in the video. Andrew Pinsett is brilliant. If anyone objects, don't just write to Andrew. He'll delete it. Um, so, but how many ways can we come in contact with the person? How, how many ways might... Uh, so one way is just to, to see them, but we don't see the person by our eyeballs. We... We believe there's a person based on theory of mind. We don't see persons. How many ways can we come in contact with a person? Well, they can write us letters. They don't have to be in the same room. They can be, along, they can be thousands of miles away. That can put us in contact with a person. They can send us an email. They can send smoke signals. Just think of all the ways that there are for us to form true beliefs about persons. And when I get that email or get that letter, I instantly have a person belief. I, I think I know what their thoughts are. So you don't have to, not only is it not necessary for us to see, not, sorry, not only is it not possible for us to see persons, I don't even have to see their bodies in order for theory of mind to produce uh, a justified belief about persons. However, I have to be in the right sort of causal relation to the person. The person had to have sent the email, written a letter. If somebody sends an email and his uh, email to me, and I formed the belief that he sent it and he had these feelings, well, I got it wrong. Um, I, I messed up. I, I'm not in the right sort of causal contact with him. That's not the typical situation. But if he sends one, I don't have to see his body in order for me to use theory of mind and form a, 
uh, a justified or rational belief about him as a person. So, um, again, in order to have a justified belief about persons, we have to have the right process involved. That's the agency detecting device and theory of mind. And we have to, the person has to be the cause of that belief. But the chain between us and that person can be pretty distant. Well, now I would have called it God and other minds, but that's been taken. Uh, so God and other elephants. So, here's a, so let's come back to belief in God. What would make belief in God rational? If God is an agent and a person, then uh, agency detecting device and theory of mind are adequate to their object. They're the right sorts of faculties that could give us some sorts of true beliefs about God. So um, they, they seem like they'd be appropriate. So if those are the faculties that are the right process for belief about God, and there might be others, and I'm not saying using those is all you need to do to understand God or that God wouldn't exceed Eight, uh, Ad and Tom, but if God is an agent and a person, then those seem to be the right sort of processes that are involved in um, beliefs about God. Now, so Then the question is this. It's hard to say how God might properly cause our God beliefs, but I take it this to be a kind of generalized problem of other minds. It's hard to say how other persons are properly the cause of our beliefs. I take it God could send us a letter or an email message or um, speak to us through nature. There, there might be a whole bunch of ways that God could be the cause. A person might have a religious experience. Um, God, might, God might have caused us to have the cognitive faculties that we have, so that in the right circumstances we just immediately form beliefs about God. There might be lots of ways that it could work. So, um, so God, it's a sort of species of the problem of other minds. As long as God is the ultimate cause of our beliefs, and it's hard to say exactly how that might go. And as long as we use the right faculties, agency detecting device and theory of mind, then it seems to me a person could have a justified belief about God. And it doesn't seem that God has to be the immediate cause of the belief. A person might have um, some sort of experience of God. And I think in America about 60 or 70 percent, Helen sent me this statistic and I was surprised because a lot of Americans think they've had an experience of God. A lot of them, and it surprised me. Uh, evidently not so many Brits, but a lot of Americans think they have. Um, and, but it doesn't, that, that doesn't have to be the case. If that is the case, and then somebody cognizes God, then, um, then I take it their belief could be justified. But God could be the ultimate cause of the belief, and if that's the case, then it seems to me a person could have a rational or justified belief in God. And so here's my conclusion. If there is a God, then beliefs are likely, then God beliefs are likely rational. And if there is no God, then they're probably not rational. And I'm not saying they are rational. Um, I'll, I'll clarify this in just a little bit. But if there is a God, like wh who's an agent and a person, then the agency detecting device and theory of mind seem to be the right processes. And if there is a God and he he's the ultimate cause of your belief, then your beliefs are likely rational. But if there isn't a God, then your beliefs are not likely rational. Because the part about you being in the proper, uh, sorry, the, the object of your belief being the cause of your belief, that part's not satisfied. So I think in spite of what um, Dawkins, Dennett, and other folks have claimed, figuring out that there's some sort of cognitive faculties involved in the belief doesn't show you that the belief is or isn't rational. Um, I, I just think they haven't looked deep enough. And when you look more deeply, I think you can see how, given what we learn about the cognitive science of religion, belief in God could be rational. This is my multimedia extravaganza. It's as good as it gets. <laughs> We're ready for atheism. And so here's the point I want to make. What's good for the goose, what's, or what's good for the theist, is going to be good for the atheist. Um, so Dawkins, Dennett, and others think that once they find the sort of psychic urges that are moving people to religious belief, they've shown that it's a delusion. Well, couldn't there be psychic urges that move people to unbelief? Why, why think only theists have some sort of psyche that's involved in their religious belief? Why wouldn't, why wouldn't every belief have something that's involved? And I, I told Justin Barrett for a number of years, why is it that 
we're only studying religious belief. Why, why aren't we studying unbelief? Why, why just religious belief? And I have, I have a pretty good idea. I think people think if we can figure out the psychic causes of religious belief, we'll have undermined it. And I've shown you why I think that's not successful. But I want to turn the table on uh, atheism. And so here's an, so I want to look at the cognitive science of irreligion. And these studies are, uh, some of them have only been published within the last six months. I feel like I'm on the cutting edge. And we philosophers almost never feel like that. <laughs> um, Brian Leftow's been on the cutting edges of the Middle Ages for, well, I want to say 500 years, but that would, you're not even anywhere near that old. Brian and I are almost exactly the same age. So uh, we're going to, we're, we have to carry on with one another and uh, ripe old age. I'm gonna, from now on, I'm only going to say nice things about you. <laughs> Dennett says this, evolution is a universal acid. And what he means by this is that under, it undermines many of our most precious beliefs. What does it undermine? Free will, he thinks it undermines. Our sense of an enduring self, he thinks it undermines. Consciousness, he thinks it undermines. And belief in God, he thinks it undermines. It undermines everything except what Daniel Dennett believes, which I think is Ironic. Uh, anyway, if it's a universal acid, then it should be applied to everything. And so I want to apply it to atheism. And this is from William James. I love this quotation. Whatever you think of William James, he is maybe the best writer in the history of philosophy. And he wrote this. Scientific theories are organically conditioned just as much as religious emotions are. And if we only knew the facts intimately enough, we should doubtless see the liver determining the dicta of the sturdy atheist as decisively as it does those of the Methodist under conviction anxious about his soul. They are equal, equally organically founded, be they of religious or non-religious content. So, how about, let's get inside. I, I showed you the inside of the theist brain. I want to show you the inside of the atheist brain. Where are you here? I gotta get B on the right. Here we go. All right, so it's a joke, okay? It's a joke. Uh, he, he called God a delusion and he sold two million copies. This is, this is as bad as I'm going to be here about the atheist, so. So what, what, what have we learned in the last couple of years about atheism and cognitive science? What we've learned is this. There's a, um, not just a correlation between atheism and autism. There's, um, it's been shown that uh, autism mediates atheism. Let me just give you some of the studies. Um, the first study was done with discussion forums and internet questionnaires. And the discussion forums were mostly of young people that are, uh, are or have been diagnosed as, uh, or have been diagnosed as autistic. And there are discussion forums where they can come together as a group and discuss, um, you know, how to go through life uh, with one another, with like-minded people. And uh, in the discussion forums, what they've, the initial studies did was they coded people based on the comments they made. They did two things. One is they did a kind of intuitive coding for uh, where someone might fall in an autistic autism spectrum. And, and there's a wide range in, in an autism spectrum. Uh, I'll, I'll show you the range just a little bit. Uh, my wife's not autistic at all. She thinks I am. Uh, you know, so I, I'm a little bit higher up on the scale. At any rate, they would intuitively code where they thought people might go on the autism scale. And then they looked, because people sometimes discuss religious beliefs, they looked at how they identified themselves as religious believers. That, that's the initial set of studies. And then what they did was they contacted some of these folks. And um, so they looked at them in a discussion forum and they had them fill out internet questionnaires. And what they found was this, is that uh, the higher up you are in the atheism scale, sorry, autism scale, the less likely it is that you are to have religious beliefs. Or the less likely you are to be sure of your religious beliefs. And again, the correlation goes the other way. The lower down you are on the autism scale, the more neurotypical you are, the more likely you are to have religious beliefs. We've already shown that it's normal, natural to have religious beliefs. Um, 
but it looks like if there's a cognitive defect, some kind of cognitive defect, people are less likely to have religious beliefs. So this set of studies was the first that showed that there seemed to be a correlation between autism and religious belief. And in subsequent studies, uh, high-functioning autistics, uh, so fairly high up in the scale, um, um, can be just slightly below people with Asperger's, but people with Asperger's and then other high-functioning autistics, they're, they're two to three times as likely to identify as atheists. So it's pretty statistically significant. And I'm not going to go into, I have to see what time it is so I don't, 9-11, okay, we've got plenty of time. Um, what uh, Sharif and Noren Zion have done is more sophisticated studies with, instead of relying on people who identify themselves in the internet, they've gone and, uh, and have a large group of people that have been diagnosed as autistic and they've gone and given them um, these questionnaires where given the questionnaires you can place where somebody might fall on the autism scale. And you can find these online and the person that's done the, some of the best work on it is, uh, is uh, Simon Baron Cohen at Cambridge. He's one of the leading uh, autism researchers and we're going to, I'm going to mention his, I always get a chuckle when I mention this in America because everyone thinks I'm joking when I say Simon Baron Cohen because they think it's Sasha Baron Cohen. Uh, <laughs> I thought they were brothers, cousins. All right, so cousins, whatever. They're re they are related, I know that. Uh, but I usually get a chuckle in the U.S. because people believe I, then they think, from this point on, they think I'm making everything up. They think, <laughs> they're, they're waiting for someone to come in, forget it. Um, so anyway, the Sasha Simon, Baron Cohen, what he argues fairly convincingly is that what's, what's, What's the, what's the thing that's going wrong in the autistic brain? And what he argues is what's going wrong in the, uh, in the autistic brain is that they lack a theory of mind. He calls it a mentalizing deficit. And think what that would be. You don't, you don't see other people's, you don't immediately get other people's thoughts, feelings, and desires. They don't register, and so you don't respond to them as a person. I, I had a student who was um, diagnosed Asperger's and uh, she didn't need a diagnosis, we, we all knew. And she, she would come to our, off, our offices and she would talk and talk and talk and talk and just drone on and on and on. And, and you would give the clues that, you know, you'd move over and you try to give the normal clues that it's time, time to go and she, she couldn't pick up any clues. And you often had to just kind of push her out the door and. She, and she'd go down the hall and she'd just be talking the whole time. She wouldn't stop talking. And she, she lacked the ability to um, understand another person. So what Sharif and Noren Zion did was they, they located people on an autism scale. And again, you can go online and do this. There's an autism spectrum quotient. You can find out if you want. Uh, if you're a professor, I'm going to give you a good reason not to do it. Uh, um, but you can go online and do it and they ask questions like, do you like to chit chat? Do, uh, do you like to um, be alone or work with other, or hang around other people? It's, most of them are kind of obvious what they're getting at and some of them aren't so obvious, but there are 40 or 50 questions and you can go through and fill out these questions and find out where it is you might fall in an autism scale. And so they ranked people on the autism scale and then they tried to identify what is it that's mediating belief in God. Not, and so they, what they wanted to figure out is not just what is the correlation. That correlation, they, they figured out the correlation was about right that had been figured out in the previous studies. They wanted to see well, what's the cause, what mediates it. And it turns out what mediates it is, is mentalizing deficits. There's something else autistics tend to do, they tend to be systemizers. They tend to put things in sort of rational, systematic. They like to, do, so they'll ask like, do you like to do the same things over and over again? If your schedule is interrupted, uh, you know, there, something is asked. And so they tend to be systemizers. And what they found out was that it's not the systemizer part that mediated religious belief. It was the mentalizing deficit. In fact, there are many 
uh, high-functioning autistics that have religious beliefs, but they tend to be highly systemized. They tend to be fairly abstract, fairly math, kind of mathematical, rational. They tend to like rituals. They tend to figure out that it's good for them to be in communities, and they go to church and do things they know are good for them. So they've got it in like a rational system. So it wasn't the systemizer part that's common to um, aut high-functioning autistics that was mediating it. It was the mentalizing deficit. And, and it's easy to figure out why, really. Uh, if, if God is a person or if the kind of normal, typical religious beliefs are of God as a person, then if you lack the ability to cognize persons, you're going to lack the ability to have belief in a personal God. You're not going to be able to have it. You're going to be psychologically prevented from having it. Lacking theory of mind, which looks like it's essential to having, um, being able to acquire a belief in God, is, looks like it's going to be a pretty obvious candidate for the thing that's preventing people from belief in God. So again, people with higher scores in the autism spectrum had reduced ability to mentalize. And, so, and here's the autistic, autism scale. At the, at the bottom are females. They tend to be, as a group, uh, pretty low on the uh, autism scale. They, they tend to be better at reading people's thoughts, feelings, and desires. And males are, as a group, less able to do that. I went and announced this to my wife. I said, you know what? I figured out. Women are better at reading thoughts, feelings, and desires. Men aren't, aren't as good at it. She said, I've been telling you this for years. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and then professors, when I was a grad student at Notre Dame, she used to pick me up and she'd just see all the ways these professors, all the clothes they wore and the hairdos and the, and uh, she thought they weren't totally integrated with social reality, I guess would be a nice way of saying it. And uh, professors as a group tend to be higher up on the autism scale than, than uh, males as a group. And scientists are even higher up on the scale, and then mathematicians, and then Asperger's, and then high-functioning autistics. And so that's the scale, and here's the other thing you see in the scale. The higher up the scale you go, the less likely people are to believe in God. Atheism and agnosticism increases dramatically the higher up the scale you go. So that's the research, the, at least the results of the research. So now, atheists, brace yourself. Is atheism normal? Leaving normal, I like that. So uh, here's the thing to see. Religious belief involves properly functioning cognitive faculties. And atheism is correlated with and mediated by a cognitive defect. There's a mentalizing deficit, uh, defective theory of mind. These are the two things to get in your head. So is atheism normal? This is the problem. And I want to think about it. Um, and here's what I, the way I want to think it. So is, is, atheism nor, is atheism normal? Okay, we'll come back to our atheist normal in a minute. Is atheism normal? And the answer is no. Atheism is not normal. And by normal, I mean what's, what's the statistical norm? What's the median? We have to understand what we mean by normal. And what we've figured out is normal, we can do this sociologically, we can do surveys around the world, and what we find around the world is 90 some percent of believers have, 90 percent of people have God beliefs, and they believe in God to a certain degree. This is an IQ uh, spectrum. I couldn't find one that uh, illustrated this, but I can make the point with uh, IQs in just a second. So what we find with respect to atheism's being normal is that if we define normal as what's believed by X number of people, X percentage of people, um, we're going to find normal falls within some range here, and it's going to be a fairly high belief in God. So atheism is not normal. Now, here's the thing. So let's, let's put it just another way. Um, suppose we wanted to ask this, is belief in evolution normal? I think we'd find that it's not normal. Why is that? Because most people reject it. We'd find the degree to which people hold or reject it. We'd find that belief in evolution is not normal. Um, my guess is that most people don't um, 
believe in quantum uncertainty. That's not normal. It's really hard to believe, by the way. There are lots of things that are really hard to believe that are probably true, but they're not normal. All, all it says about atheism, all I'm saying about atheism's being normal is it doesn't fall within the range of what most people believe. It's statistically down here, or not up here. By the way, Mother Teresa wouldn't be normal on this view. Anyone who's really certain that there's a God would not be normal. Normal is, you know, whatever is in, we can define it, but it's going to be whatever falls within a standard deviation of some figure. So whether or not a, a belief is normal doesn't tell us anything about whether or not it's true. A belief could be normal and untrue. So atheism isn't normal, but I guess I'd just say no big deal. I, I wouldn't care. There are lots of beliefs that are not normal. They're, they don't fall within the statistical average, but they're true. So um, what I've said so far, I think, is um, it's not normal, but I, I guess I'd just say, so what? Then the question is this. Are atheists normal? This, this is really the important question, I think. And I'll, I want to think about why it's the important question. So here I did work up some of the data. And so here's degree of belief in God. And the higher you are in the autism spectrum, the less likely you are to believe in God. Um, and then the lower you are in the autism spectrum, um, people that are um, neurotypicals, on average, have a pretty high degree of belief in God. And belief in God dramatically declines. Atheism and agnostic increases pretty dramatically. So the degree of belief, I take it, let's take anything below 50% would be unbelief, some kind of unbelief. 50-50 might be an agnostic. But you see agnosticism and atheism increasing pretty dramatically the higher up someone is on the autism spectrum. So the question is this, are atheists normal? And here's the thing I think you need to see. All we know is that if you're in this group of people, if you're in this group, you're likely to be an atheist or an agnostic. Likely, but we don't know if you are or aren't. We have no idea. All we know is that when we plot things on a graph, we're talking about groups of people and people on the, this high, uh, this, at this stage of the um, autism spectrum quotient, people in this stage are likely to be atheists or agnostics, but they, they may not be. We don't know anything about any particular person. We, we know this as well. If we know someone is a religious, strong religious believer, they're, they're not likely to be high in the high functioning autism spectrum. But somebody could be high in the autism spectrum and still be a fairly confirmed religious believer. We don't know anything about any particular person. All we know is something about plots on a graph. We know something about the tendencies of groups of people. That's all we know. And we can't say anything about whether or not any particular atheist is normal or abnormal, is autistic or not autistic. You can have your speculations about people, I guess. But you can't know. You can't know because you can't see what it is that mediates their belief or unbelief. You just can't know. We don't have access to that. So we ha you have no idea if any atheist is normal or abnormal. If I, if I were the theistic Richard Dawkins, I would write a book called The Atheist Delusion. But the evidence doesn't support it. We don't know what goes on inside any atheist's mind. We don't know. I think I'm a theist. I think atheism isn't true. But I don't know, based on autism studies, whether or not in any particular case what mediates somebody's belief is the uh, mentalizing deficit or something else. Maybe it's the problem of evil they think is unovercomable. I don't know what goes on in anybody's mind. And here's the other thing. Richard Dawkins and Dennett, they don't know what goes on in my mind that's produced my belief. They have no idea. They don't know if, I was, if my belief was produced by the God pill and no God, or if it was produced by a religious experience which puts me in direct contact with God. They have no idea. 
You, you can't tell. When you figure out the cognitive faculties that might be involved in beliefs, and here's the thing, I think we're going to find out in cognitive science more and more of the science of belief. We're going to find more and more out about what cognitive faculties are involved in belief. And what we're going to find out is that it's really complicated. Um, and, and that we can't, we can't tell in any particular case whether another person's belief is um, a delusion, an uh, illusion, a rational, irrational. We can't tell based on the stuff we learn in cognitive science. We just have no idea. So here's, here's what, let's agree to this. What, what would make a theist or an atheist irrational? Let's say that an atheist whose belief is mediated solely by a cognitive defect is irrational. Okay, if that's, if your cognitive faculties aren't putting you in proper touch with reality, I don't know, irrational or crazy. I don't, let's just, let's just agree to that. If it's, if an atheist only doesn't believe in God because of a mentalizing deficit, let's call him irrational. And let's, let's say the same thing about a theist. If a theist, if their belief is mediated solely by uh, the agency detecting device in a theory of mind, let's say that belief is irrational. If God wasn't involved in the causal process in any way, if he wasn't the ultimate cause of the belief, if, if the theory of mind and the agency detecting device sort of produced the belief un, unprovoked by God, let's call that belief irrational. Let's, let's all agree that these two groups of people would be irrational. The question is this. So on this view, some atheists are rational and some aren't. But which ones are and which ones aren't, we don't really know because none of us knows in any particular atheist case if their belief was mediated solely by a co cognitive defect. And Dawkins and Dennett don't, don't know in any theist case if their belief was mediated solely by an agency detecting device in a theory of, of mind. So some are rational and some aren't, but we don't know. And we can't write a book saying that everybody who disagrees with us is irrational. We just don't know. And some theists are rational and some aren't, but you can't make any universal claims about the rationality or irrationality of atheists or theists or atheism or theism. So here's what came back to Jesse Baring. He thinks based on his studies, we find the psychic causes of religious belief. It's just the agency detecting device in the theory of mind. We, so we know God is a delusion. We've got God by the throat. All we need to do is squeeze. Uh, Noren Zion and Sharif, who did, the, I think, the two best studies on atheism and autism, they're atheists, but they write, I think, the most sensible thing they could possibly have written. Not that atheists are irrational, they write this. We emphasize that our data do not suggest that disbelief solely arises through mentalizing deficits. Multiple psychological and sociocultural pathways likely lead to a complex and overdetermined phenomenon such as disbelief in God. This is a long way of saying any particular person's belief is really complicated and we, we don't know. We have no idea. We can't make any general conclusions about this. And so here's what I suggest. And let's just bring this full circle back to religious belief. I think we should just change equals for equals here. That when you figure out what cognitive faculties are involved in religious belief, even if we do it fairly exhaustively, um, it's going to be like this. This should be the conclusion we draw. We emphasize that our data do not suggest that belief in God arises solely through ADD and theory of mind. Multiple psychological and sociocultural pathways likely lead to a complex and overdetermined phenomenon such as belief in God. And then you just leave it at that. This is what the science shows. It doesn't show us one, um, it doesn't give us one bit of information about whether any particular person is normal or abnormal, reasonable or unreasonable. Uh, when they do that, they've gone beyond the bounds of science uh, into philosophy, and they've gone into bounds of bad philosophy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kelly. Just to bring up up to date on something you might be a little bit interested in, there was a debate with Richard Dawkins here in Oxford 15 months ago, and he was asked, um, was he absolutely certain that there's no God? And he said he was almost absolutely certain. He gave a figure for it. He said 6.9 out 
out of seven. So I thought you might want to. Ah, that's, where he, that's, yeah. that's where he placed himself on the scale. So. Richard Swinburne could work with that. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay we have about half an hour of questions. Right. And um, if you'd like to, um, have, if you don't mind waiting until um, Ignacio comes around with a the microphone, then we'll be able to get your question recorded. Thank you. Um, you talk about normality. I wonder, do you mind talking about what's natural? Because, I mean, people, some people, for instance, would say that religion is natural in a way that science isn't, that science is a second-order thing, in which case atheism is a bit more like theology, whereas religion are, are basic impulses that we know most people naturally have. Yeah, no, I, I could use the word natural. I, yeah. I, I use the word um, normal for a, a reason, it, it seems to, it, in most cases, it seems to have a sort of evaluative mm -hmm. sense, and sometimes it does. And, um, and so I like to use the term normal and then deconstruct it a little bit. And I want to deconstruct it to get rid of the kind of evaluative um, sense that it has. Uh, but natural would have been a perfectly natural and probably better word to use with respect to religious belief. Religious belief is natural, and mm -hmm. it's normal in the statistical sense uh, um, to a to a uh, fairly high degree of belief, that's statistically normal. But natural would be a better. Um, thank you very much. A very uh, stimulating presentation. Can I suggest that um, there's a there's a an important omission in your representation of cognitive. No. <laughs> but you're going um, to go ahead, right? Uh, but but in a sense, it it it, it plays both ways. It's um, yeah. an anti Dawkins uh, yeah. position as well as a, um, a a challenge to what you've said. Is um, uh, in addition to add and uh, the theory of mind, um, the most generalized um, proposition out of study of cognitive processes is what's known as the fundamental attribution error. And the fundamental attribution error very crudely says that in, in all sorts of natural situations, the kind of things that you've been, we have a uh, systematic and very pervasive and very powerful tendency to attribute cause to people as opposed to the situation. Yeah. Um, and you can see that all, all the way around. So, you know, whenever there is a disaster, we want somebody to blame. Yeah. We don't go and look at the situation and, and the factors there. If you add that in, well, it seems to me to make a lot of sense of lots of the bits of your, your presentation. The first is that um, the, the chances are, whether or not there is a God, we have no good representation of that God because we are doing it via the fundamental attribution error. So we're over-personalising whatever God would be there. Um, the second is, it absolutely <clears throat> makes a proposition about the link between autism and atheism, because what autistics don't do is commit the fundamental attribution error. They don't see people as more important than the situation. Yeah. The third thing is, it accounts for the evolutionary cost, because the most powerful benefit that religion brings is the social group which is religions tend to favor in group and generate group cohesiveness yeah. it's not a cognitive advantage it's a social advantage i'm sorry that wasn't yeah. a question I yeah apologize. no I, I take it as a friendly uh contribution yeah no and um the so the latter part so i i, I think with respect to um, groups there are, um, this plays, religion can play into the worst part of our, um, our kind of, our tribalism. We, I think we're by nature tribalists. And so, and we're by nature tribalists because it was a good thing to be able to quickly form a belief about who's in your group and, who, and who's an enemy. That's what you needed to do. You need to do it quickly. And so we do it on, it probably initially was kin, but then it spread to people like us, people with roughly the same skin color. Um, and, um, and then, you can add religion, so so people not in our group are enemies, and religious belief can be a way to um, one more way of saying who's enemy and who isn't, and it probably um, is involved in why we tend to think, you know, Muslims. Why, why it's so easy to think Muslims are terrorists, yeah. um, even though uh, statistically it's not true, 
Uh, that's not the norm, but that, but that we want to think enemies. We want to form beliefs qu quickly. We have, age, we have, I guess it's fundamental attribution error. Something's going on there in, in um, identifying, putting a person behind, or a group of people behind some really bad thing. He's got it. Oh, thanks. Kelly, I, I wanted to ask a bit about methodology and specifically your point about the correlation between um, autism and disbelief. And uh, in particular, the graph that you showed. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, what was the methodology for the y-axis? Was, was that a scale devised by Oops. Simon Barrington Cohen? And what Whoops. was the comparable methodology for the horizontal axis? I'm doing axis? the wrong thing. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Do you want to go oh, back? I'm trying. I, I don't know what I did. It's quite useful to have that graph in front of us. Yeah. So, no, no, the two other or three graph. back oh, from that. Graph. Two or three. That so, one, that's it. Here's the graph. I made it up. And, and the, oh. <laughs> There's, there was no, no, none of them have a graph, so I just made it to ah. illustrate their, ah. the rough idea that they had because I wanted to pe see people that, I wanted people to see what you do as you end up with things on graphs. But you were citing, I thought, empirical data. Well, so what was the methodology behind the empirical, even if that graph is fictitious, what was the methodology behind the empirical data that you were citing? So I wanted to figure, I wanted, so here, the, roughly the empirical data, th there's a lot, the problem is there are four or five different studies that I was throwing up on the graft, graph, and the, the main idea is that so, so there are a variety of ways of assigning people, assigning values to the autism spectrum quotient. So there isn't just one figure that goes on here. And they don't use these numbers. They're different sets of numbers oh. that are by different okay. people. So I, I just put things together so people could see you get roughly some graph like this. Mm. But not, no one's made a graph. Well, then let me ask one subsidiary question. You rather sort of shattered what I thought I'd understood. Um, the subsidiary question is, has anyone investigated the direction of causality? In other words, it could be that autism tends to disbelief, or it could be that belief in God is helpful in some sort of cognitive behavioral therapy way in, um, in dealing with autism. Has anyone investigated that? I, I don't know that that's been investigated. Okay. I mean, Frankly, a lot of people that work in this area don't really want God believes to be helpful in any way. They, t they tend to be, it tends to be motivated by people who are... I don't think Barrington Cohen would be averse to that. Uh, he might not be. I don't know. I only know his, I only know what he does on mentalizing deficits okay. and how it's factored into the, um, the empirical work of uh, Sharif and Noren Zion. Okay. So Thank I, you. Okay, so, so as you point out, there's several uh, reasons why people can be uh, atheists, and one of them is autism, but a more important one strikes me as just, you know, um, yeah. sorry? Hit, they can't hear you. Oh, right. So, so there are several roads, uh, cognitive roads to, uh, to, to atheism. One of them is autism, but one of them undoubtedly also is that there seems to be this climate that, you know, being atheist is a rational thing. But so given that, I wonder what you make of the beliefs, and there have been some studies recently that show that people who are atheists and not autistic, I, I assume, uh, tend to have these sort of tacit beliefs. Uh, like, for instance, there was this study recently where people were asked, they had to ask God to do terrible things, like, you know, strike them with cancer and stuff like that. And it turned out that people were really, I mean, their skin conductivity, they were really very stressed. So also atheists, so they had this stress response. It was really very, very hard for them to do that. And then there was another study, I think it was by Haywood and Baring, uh, showing that people who, uh, who are atheists, nevertheless, they think that things have a purpose, like I failed this exam because I needed to be shown that it wouldn't actually end my life and sort of thing. It doesn't yeah. make any... So what do you make of beliefs like that? So it's really interesting that people actually have to do this cognitive effort so, so what do you make of that in, in this discussion? Um, so I, I just want to say one thing. Sharif and Noren Zion actually have four different um, sort of cognitive causes of unbelief. And the most famous one is that, that they think there's a correlation between analytic thinking and atheism. And it was published in a lot of 
Um, the New York Times published it, USA Today, Huffington Post. Um, it got in the journal Nature. It's the worst of their essays. The other essays on autism are much better than the one in analytic thinking. But the idea is that analytic thinking is like rational thinking, system two, careful, thoughtful, reflective thinking, whereas um, unreflective, um, immediate, intuitive thinking, that's what theists do, and that, that produces all sorts of errors. So the claim was a atheists are more analytic and theists are more stupid, I guess, is the bottom line. And I, I didn't go over that one, but I think there are things to say about their studies. So there are other, there are other cognitive um, causes that have been identified as sources of uh, atheism, or at least involved in atheism. So she asked about these other things. I, I think we're not uh, as much as they might. Um, so it doesn't fit in with their worldview. That, but we do have these. The, the, I'm thinking of the purpose. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the uh, Deb Kellerman has done a number of studies that are, she argues that we're intuitive te teleologists. That we naturally see purpose. We don't just see persons, but we see purpose, or we believe there's purpose. We we ascribe it to things. And so she did a a study with. She, most of her work has been done with children. That's what most people know. And, so children, you know, why are mountains pointy? And they say, so people don't sit on them. And why, are, why is water wet? And they say, so, so boats can sit on them. And so the answer is in terms of purpose. But she did a study with U.S. professors, PhDs in science. And she did a study where she had things like, why are giraffes' necks really long? Um, why, are, why do penguins have wings? Why do... Ducks have web feet, a whole bunch of things where little kids might answer in, in terms of purpose, but if you're a trained scientist and you have time to think, you won't answer in terms of purpose. You'll say, you'll do it in terms of antecedent clauses. But then she took that, she, so that's the control group. She took another group of PhDs in science and they, they had to do a time study. So they had to answer quickly. And when they had to answer quickly, the default mechanism was purpose. They quickly Sort of, and so it looks like our our default, our natural instinct, is towards purpose. Um, so I I guess human beings really aren't very consistent. We have these cognitive faculties, and they've probably managed to weed out or tame or all of the cognitive all these cognitive faculties. Just our tendencies. Culture can uh, plays a huge role in how we come to acquire beliefs, and um, it isn't just the cognitive faculties. It's um, culture, but there are. There are cognitive faculties they may not have been able to consciously control yet. Uh, Doctor, you are a wonderful speaker. Thank you. You really are. I'd like to try to remind you all where, or remind, remind us all where we are and where we where we sit today. Most of us, in coming here, walked across a cross in the road where men were burnt to death. It's important to understand what it means to be burnt to death. And I've had a little epiphany here whilst listening to you. The belly bursts. The entrails fall into the flames. That's what it's like. Those men didn't have a belief, I think, they had a perception. So the question really, I think, is, never mind about belief. How in our, in our time could we have a perception of God? What would you expect it to be like? How would you expect to prepare for it? That's the question. And I don't expect an answer just now. I know. I, I, you, know you almost took my breath away just asking it. Um, so I, I wanted to comment on his, I meant to when you talked about the fundamental attribution error, it seems to me we're, we're very likely inclined to get lots of things wrong about God. That's, and I take it that's part of what we've figured out um, you know, in the past 500 years since people were burned for their beliefs. Um, it's easy to make mistakes and it's easy to over, uh, I was telling Andrew, and th this is going to go a long ways towards me not answering your question, but, <laughs> but I, I was 
the first early theological influences on me were hyper-Calvinists who defined themselves over and against people that um, they disagreed with. So Catholics were really bad people, and, um, and uh, Arminians, and uh, almost anyone who disagreed with us were, were bad people, and they were going to um, burn in hell. It was an ter eternal torture chamber forever. And, um, and then I went to Notre Dame, and I, I met these Catholics, and they just didn't seem like <laughs> these... <laughs> They didn't seem like suitable candidates to burn in hell forever. I don't know. And anyway, I just met people, and uh, and it it made me. Uh, I became a kind of mere Christianity guy. Like, uh, let's 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 decide that ve that there's very little that you need to find that somebody else is your brother or sister. And then even people. And then so now I work in religious liberty and tolerance as an, an area I'm concerned about, in part because of violence issues and and so it's forced me to go back and look at the gospels and see how Jesus treated enemies and it wasn't at all like I was taught the, the, about the way we should treat people who are different from us which is a problem of the fundamental attribution error we always want to find people who are like us and so um, and so it really has changed how I look at um, at how powerful it is to want in-group things and to be clear and to know that You've got it all right, and um, and how much in humility we need to resist that, and humanity ultimately is going to depend on our ability to resist that. I, I don't think it it means, as Dawkins and others think, I don't think it means giving up religious beliefs, but I think religious believers need to find the light in their religious belief and not the dark side, which is is often what people find, and it, we often find it because we want because we're tribalist. We want to. We want to know who our enemies are. He's the, he's the master. Hi, I just, just probably quite a short question, um, but something that I think is, is fairly important. Um, you haven't really defined the kind of God that you're talking about, whether it's a uh, father or a savior, or if it's just an other. Um, mm -hmm. And I think when you're talking about rationality of beliefs, you know, whatever you call rationality and whatever we define that to be, um, those kinds of questions are fairly important. I think yeah. a lot of um, agnostics or people maybe who didn't relate to uh, um, a, a doctrine kind of father um, would say, oh, it's, it's irrational, but I still believe in an other. And I think um, it would be useful. I didn't know kind of what, what God you were referencing and, and perhaps if you could elaborate a little bit. Yeah, so God is a little... Um loaded and misleading to talk about in, in this context because really what, what's natural is belief in, I guess, disembodied spirits. And, and so it isn't just, it, doesn't, it turns out it's not just that it's natural to have beliefs in so, something probably fairly supreme, but it's produced beliefs in ghosts, spirits, fairies, elves. There are all sorts of things that the agency detecting device and the theory of mind has produced. So extra humans is probably, or disembodied spirits is probably the more neutral way to say it. That said, it also looks like what's happened in human history, and I didn't mention any of this, um, is that those, those beliefs look like they got canalized, like everything sort of got moved down into something like a belief in some sort of high God who's a super knower, who knows you know, what we do when other people aren't looking. Um, and that's an important thing because um, we can't spend all our time policing each other. But if there's a God who knows what we do when other humans aren't looking, we don't need a big police force. Uh, and if he rewards and punishes um, in this life and the next, then we don't need a big um, legal system. You know, groups can funk, groups can get bigger and bigger that inculcate those sorts of beliefs. And so there are other parts of cognitive science of religion. And I, I find sup the so-called supernatural punishment theory that, that successful human groups are ones that ended up with something like a belief in a super knower um, who exercises a kind of moral providence, rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. Um, so you could add that to it. Um, and then otherwise it's neutral with respect to any religious beliefs. I don't mean to load it 
in terms of God as Father or God as anything else. N nothing in any of this um, favors one religion over any other. Although it does say this, it's probably really hard to be a Buddhist. Um, that is a real serious non, -es uh, non kind of scholarly Buddhist where you, where you sorry, uh, the, the real the kind of atheism Buddhist. In fact, most Buddhists are theists. Most Buddhists believe in gods, or and often a high god, and they believe in a next life where if you're good you get there, and if you're bad you don't. So, um, so it does seem to move people in a some sort of god direction, and not towards religious atheism. Thanks very much again for the, the talk. Um, you stimulated another thought in my mind. I'd like you to make a comment on the theological implications of what you've been saying. Um, I'm speaking as a, a professor and a scientist, which puts me fairly high up the autistic spectrum on your slide. <laughs> so you can um, judge me. Is your wife here? <laughs> <laughs> she allowed me to come out tonight. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to... I ask you about the theological implications, beginning with that slide that you showed, a little movie about the, the nasty triangle chasing the other one, to ask if you could tell us a little bit more how that was made. Was it genuinely random motion, or did the filmmaker actually um, bias it in some way so that we would tend to ascribe uh, agency to what we were looking at? Yeah. It's actually very difficult to make something truly random, which is why Jackson Pollock was such a brilliant artist. It's very hard to do what he did. Yeah. Um, so it takes a person to recognize the activity of another person, as it were. Yeah. Um, so and what, is, are so, there any psychologists here? Does anyone know? Do you know if it was really random? I think they, uh, they uh, like to do that? or. Yeah. That wasn't random, but it was, it was specifically, yeah. Helen says it wasn't random. Yeah, okay, it, well, it didn't look random to me. designed to evoke these, these but, ideas. Sorry, can, can I, we're, we're in danger of misusing the term random. There's a, there's a statistical randomness, mm -hmm. but the point was that none of those objects had agency. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the fundamental attribution of it was that we attribute to them um, the theory of mind well, and agency and purpose and in fact cause and effect and none of yes. those things are yeah. true it's almost impossible to see the film as merely triangles, dots um, squares I take that point perfectly well but as a scientist and an autistic professor um, <laughs> I detect a purpose in the person who made that film Okay. That wasn't the oh, oh being asked may, maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. My, but my point is that we are very good at recognizing non randomness, just like we can recognize small deviations from perfect symmetry. And that has evolutionary benefits. Yeah. And, and you explained that that tends to make us make judgments about purpose. Um, it also makes us tend to make judgments about the actions of other people. So I wonder if the theological implication of what you're saying is that only God can judge us. Um, and I take heart actually from what you've been saying because some of my um, atheist friends will actually be judged more leniently by God because of their autism <laughs> um, <laughs> than some of my friends who, other friends who've had a very um, beneficial genetic makeup and uh, social background and yet still reject God. Um, so God's judgment is the only one that's perfect, and ours is very questionable. Yeah. So one thing I was going to say following his, and people blame circumstances uh, and not people. I, I thought you were going to use this sort of example. So if I show up late for something, I blame circumstances. You know, like my kids, you know, I couldn't get my kids out of the house. The traffic was bad, you know. I, but if you show up late, I blame your character. <laughs> And uh, lots of, there are a number of psych, psychology studies on it that we, we are so quick to blame other people and so quick to excuse ourselves. Now, I take it that's probably a moral failing on our part. And, um, um, and once we see this, we, I think, and then, so once we see this, I mean, it, it, 
to me it says how insidious lots of our moral failings are. They're not just insidious, they're, they're like that and we, we don't get them. We, until someone points that out, we don't realize it. I, let me say one more thing. I, I, so I've been to China about 50 times and I've been, I've been work, working to try to get religion taken more seriously in China and people have been, so we have a, autism and atheism. This is a group of people that have been institutionally force-fed atheism. And it's hard to, for me to think that they could be judged the same way by God if, if um, there's so much pressure not to believe. And it's unbelievable how much pressure there has been not to believe. And can I, I just want to add a couple things. I'm gonna, I'll get your comment. The, you're a scientist in a major university. Um, there's so much pressure to conform. So once atheism becomes the norm uh, in a university and um, there's so many subtle little clues that are sent to students that they shouldn't be believers, they shouldn't express it, and students, I mean, conformity bias is really powerful. It's so easy to, you find out in little surveys that you wily psychologists can just with a wink of an eye get, some, get someone to think this is the answer they want. And then people will give you the answer they want. I mean, it's powerful. Conformity is super powerful. And it can have radical uh, implications for people's beliefs. And it doesn't surprise me that a uni university could end up really being quickly atheistic. Yeah. Sorry, can, I, can yeah. I just make a comment on uh, the point I was trying to make about the fundamental attribution error? Sorry. Um, the point I was trying to make about the fundamental attribution error is you, you put forward the proposition that God judges. That's a human, uh, human beings judge. Clouds do not judge. So, you know, when a cloud passes over, it doesn't decide to rain on us or not. When we talk about God, we do it by personifying. We, we have this concept that God will judge. Um, we don't know. Um, that is a, a prime example of fundamental attribution error. We are looking at phenomena. Do we, you know, it, it's, we don't... I think the whole point about the cognitive science is um, the chances are we cannot make a judgment about what God is like because we bring so many biases to that proposition. Well, that's, that's part of it. But maybe, so I'll just act, speak on his behalf. It may be that uh, God sent him a letter called the Bible and it says that God is a judge. And if, if that's the case, and um, then there's a source of information that might be reliable. I mean based on our cognitive faculties alone, we wouldn't be able to tell that, but somebody may have other information. Can I just frame Can she ask a quick question? Oh, uh, yeah, we actually, we, we, we better bring it to a halt, I'm afraid, but it's, um, but, uh, but if you do want to stay so, behind. So I'm just going to say yes. one okay. quick thing and why it would be a good yes. thing for this. Men speak more quickly than yeah. women do. We've had one woman question I wouldn't mind having yeah, sure, two sure, to make it. Yeah. Three. Oh, we'll three. make it three. I forgot about Helen. Thank you very much. The question is about um, truth and rationality. You say that it was natural for um, ones to be to to have a belief of God, um, and you said also that um, atheism can be normal and true or untrue. And I find it very difficult um, to understand how, how could someone be an atheist and, or, and, and be you know, able to embrace the truth because um, the truth is, by ob the objective truth is God, even we don't understand it and grasp it. And there is also a truth about being a human being. Then if someone is an atheist, there is something which is a kind of self-descriptive um, truth. It's, it's, it's like saying that we don't want to be a human being by saying we are an atheist. Because, because being, being a theist and, and believing, I mean, believing in God is also believing in the personhood, that, our own personhood, in line with the personhood of God. And speaking about personhood also, there is three person in, in God, not one person. And the second person, which is Christ, 
is what makes us in line mm -hmm. and make us more in tune with being a human being because his, his incarnation makes us t um, in line with, with Christ. What do you have to say about that? So all of that could be true, um, but given the about three or four of the cognitive faculties I looked at, all I've said is given those things, we don't know if a, if a person is normal or abnormal, <coughs> rational or irrational. I haven't looked at all of the cognitive faculties and all of the uh, beliefs. So it may be that if you look at everything, you'll find out atheists aren't normal or aren't, aren't rational. But I don't have access to that information. So, um, and I, I don't know how you would get it. The, the human mind is just so complicated and um, I think it would be a mistake to go out and say based on what I said, atheists aren't normal or atheists are irrational, or based on these studies, it would be a mistake to go out and say that. You might say it on other grounds, but I don't think you should say it based on anything that was raised here tonight. Also, the very last thing I want to say is that um, the, those who be, those believe are not um, irrational. Any believer could be irrational. Because even we, because the manifestation of any, any belief we can have is in no way irrational, even we, we don't. We, we can have, um, we don't understand fully what we believe. We don't understand God fully because we are yeah. not there. But do you think that there is irrationality there? Um, I will take that. You and I can talk about it in just a little bit. We probably should let everyone have a glass of wine and go. If you stick around, I'll be glad to talk to you about it. All right, thank you. Thank you for sticking around and for listening. Just before we, we conclude, I'd like to advertise um, our talk in two weeks' time. The title of the talk is, Is There a Place at the Science Religion Table for Mathematics? Mm -hmm. And the speaker will be Douglas Akinski, who is a uh, university professor of mathematics and philosophy and director of the Kaufman Interfaith Institute. That's two weeks' time. Would you please now um, join me in thanking our speaker, Dr. Kelly Clark.